like our database could be a list of handwritten notes that have numbers on them. And we got to figure that out. <laughs> so we kind of got to do this harder approach and it's a little more brute forcey than I would like, but I, I, I totally feel you. One thing we're looking to do because uh, people's labs are, they're discreet, they're like very quantitative. And I feel like we've done a pretty good job as a healthcare system at getting those standardized. That may be something that we go like, hey, give us a natural language query and then we'll convert that into just like a poll. But at least right now, it's kind of just like processed as raw text on the HONA side, but we're gonna keep optimizing it, of course. Welcome to Humans of AI, where we tell the real stories of those who are building an AI or are making use of it in their daily lives. Today's guest is Adam Steinle, the co-founder and CEO of Hona AI. Adam started out as a biomedical engineer, and after a stint at Goldman Sachs at Facebook, he returned to his roots to help medical systems communicate so that providers can learn about their patients more effectively. If you want to catch the latest episodes of the Humans of AI podcast, make sure to subscribe and check out my free AI newsletter, Chaos Theory, and find me on social at Alex Chowmender. Now, without further ado, here's my talk with Adam. Hello, everybody. I'm Alex. I'm here joined with Adam. Adam is the co-founder of Hona.ai, a startup that's looking to actually do something very big in the healthcare space and incorporate some of the latest and AI advancements to, to do that. Adam can definitely tell that story more in depth, but I'd love to just tee it off for Adam to just introduce himself to share what his origin story is. So Adam, do you want to kick us off here? Yeah, I really appreciate that. It'll be helpful to get the origin story outside of this like Hona phase of my life because I feel like I've been in the AI space for a little while now, maybe before it was this big buzzwordy thing. Uh, but I started out as a biomedical engineer and I didn't want to fully commit to the medical path. So I actually did my minor in computer science and realized that I really, really loved those classes. I got kind of lost though. Most of my friends were going off to med school from my major. And I was just kind of stuck there with these degrees that said I could do numbers, but they weren't really that applicable to most jobs. So I ended up taking a job at Goldman Sachs, just sort of like followed the herd there. It wasn't a huge fit for me and no pun intended. I wanted to like hedge myself. So I ended up doing my master's in AI at night. And that's when I really fell in love with the opportunities of AI. I'm more of a business facing person, but I really did want to understand like the underlying mechanisms of all of this stuff. So I decided to just go for a full graduate degree. I was able to make a really interesting pivot to uh, Facebook, working in product management for about four years. Over there, I got to build it was some of the best experiences in my career, probably the best uh, up and through till Hona. Got to build some really awesome projects. The most AI centric was group recommendations. So we were tasked with taking all the Facebook groups, every single one that's ever made, and basically categorizing them and figuring out what matters the most to a human when they're thinking about a community. So there's different axes that a community could be about. And we had to model that. So think the interest, like skateboarding, think the location, is it by you? And after classifying all of those, we had to figure out what is the most important to white type of person such that we could recommend them to you. That was the bulk of my career over there. Uh, did a very similar model on events as well. And then I did a little bit of work on the creator space. I actually have a YouTube channel as well. I just like to do stuff like that on the side because I kind of grew up with a camera. Uh, but I worked on a little bit of creator monetization. If you've ever used the Facebook Stars product, I was coming up with some of the non-monetary incentives there. So trying to find ways to make Stars really cool for people that didn't have payments set up. So stuff like boosting content. And then from there, I could get into the Honus story, but I'll, I'll turn it back over to you if you have any questions. It sounds like, I mean, it's outside of that stint at Goldman Sachs, your career at Meta really has been all about community, community building and seeing how communities tick probably and what motivates them, how to get people to engage, to communicate, to share. And I guess even for creators to potentially monetize or, or earn a living from it. I guess before we jump into the story of Hona, I'm actually super curious in that space that you were in, how was or how do you view like AI coming into the community portion? Can AI help create a community? I can imagine that AI can amplify things, amplify certain signals. Maybe you can call this maybe a more controversial topic of like polarize people or get people to see more content that steers them a certain direction. Do you want to opine a little bit on 
the role of AI for community? Yeah. So the really big one that you call out is the fact that people can get together in maybe more extreme communities and be able to do these sort of things like in private. I, I think OpenAI actually uh, just released some stuff on this, but the LLMs are starting to be pretty effective tools for content moderation. I don't really know what the externalities of that sort of thing would be, but I know that when I was trying to keep the community safe, coded language uh, was a really difficult thing. Like it's hard to understand intent and it's hard to understand what people actually mean just by the text on the screen. LLMs might be able to be a really good way to combat that and detect if things are becoming an issue. So that could be one, especially for the really scaled out products um, like Facebook, obviously. I think another interesting one is you can use an LLM to basically make sense of a bunch of raw text and turn it into a usable data set. Uh, so I think an LLM provides a really good opportunity to make a lot of the like knowledge graphs that I used to spend a lot of time creating, and it would make it maybe more accurate and maybe more effective. So for example, an LLM could be an effective way to see if the group keeps using some sort of like coded language, like the type of thing you would see on Reddit, like a big inside joke, an LLM might be a way to actually root that to a real interest, like, oh, just general comedy or something like that. So yeah, I, I think it's just like a really interesting way to take a huge set of conversations that could happen to, to a community and actually turn it into like a usable data set where you could start to link things together and recommend things to people. Can you talk a bit about this idea of AI is starting to adopt more of a persona or personality, you can call it. And yeah. some people will say that in, in like what the classic Turing test, it's like, how do you tell whether you're talking to a bot or AI versus a human? And especially in these communities and engaged groups of people, and that can often have a anonymous feel to it, even though you can have this like Facebook profile tied to it. I think there's a little bit of hesitancy of like, oh, is the person on the other side, especially nowadays, a real person or a, a bot or a fake or an AI? I don't know if your work touched on this at all, but in the sense of like preserving the health of a community, did you ever have to wrestle with any of these type of emerging type problems? So I would say we were a little bit before becoming a huge issue. But of course, there is like this giant volume of bots. And we did have this hugely intense system on group integrity that basically could handle this sort of thing. I touched it a little bit because I had to work with setting up some of the content moderation workflows there. So we would actually have people that would just create these very large sets like this is a violent group. This is a fake group that would be like, obviously, more so in line with what you're saying. But it's not something that I got super deeply involved with. One thing that I do think about with any of these like Turing test type of examples, though, I think we're probably, you may have shared a post about this, but I think we're at a really high point in this hype, hype cycle. And one of the things that I think kind of falls by the wayside, or one of the things that I think is overblown right now, is trying to replace too much of the human to human interaction. I think that we underrate the emotional component of certain interactions. What I mean by that is I'm not as big of a fan of chatbots as an application and like mimicking a human as an application as a lot of these AI tools, or I'm not as big of a fan of like mimicking art, stuff like that. I, I think that a lot of these interactions, yes, we have them with the computer, but part of what we want is like a therapist half the time. So here's the most mundane example. If my Uber Eats order doesn't come through, and I want to get a refund, I do not want to talk to a chatbot, and I do not want to read some instruction on how I can submit a button to be eligible for a refund. Admittedly, like this is just human nature, I kind of want just someone to vent to. And I think a lot of these chatbots, because we see great numbers about like support tickets being answered, um, they're really encouraging, and like in the aggregate, they're obviously a value add. I think they just miss a really big part of the problem, which is human to human interaction. And, and you, you pose a good point, though. If you're in an anonymous community, it's like, who even knows? So I don't know if I'm the right person to talk to about that. I think it's like really interesting. But one thing I just don't love is when you really place an AI where a human is kind of supposed to be or we're replacing human to human interaction. I think it should just be like replacing human to machine interaction, at least right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's super fascinating. When I think of that Uber Eats example or anything where there's like a, an emotionally charged person and if they want some sort of response or interaction, yeah, you don't want a impersonal bot, you know, to say like, oh, 
click on this, click on this, read this, read this thing, follow this flow that a, a PM designed, right, to 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 get your refund. You want to actually have some sort of like interaction, a human interaction. So. To your point, though, I guess the problem is now I'm thinking about it, it's because it doesn't pass the Turing test. Like, I just know it's a bot. <laughs> and mm-hmm. So I'm just mad, right? Uh, if we get to the point where it's completely like, I have no idea, then yeah, I'm sure it'll be uh, a lot better in terms of the emotional aspect. Well, in the spirit of talking about like AI applications and even you know designing future ones, one of the things that you're doing is you're building a startup, the startup Hona AI. But before we talk about that exact startup, I think there's also a story behind this startup uh, as well as like how it even came to be or how you got motivated to, to do this. Do you want to share with the listeners what that is? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. This might be something that a lot of your listeners could take in like maybe their interviews with big tech. But one of my philosophies is like something can always just be the worst moment of your life or the best moment of your life. And it's kind of on you to learn from it to make it the best like pivotal moment of your life. So... What used to be the worst moment in my life was uh, I'm skiing at Copper Mountain with some buddies. Uh, last run, obviously, it's always like this. And I'm just going high speed and I basically end up wrapping my leg around the tree. If you've ever seen Conor McGregor sustain the same in- injury doing a leg kick, Paul George sustained the same injury um, in the USA basketball, like a practice game or a tournament, I forget. But basically you snap your lower leg in half. It was a tib fib injury. Really, really intense, but what really stuck out about it was I had to see so many people. So I get carted down to like from the top of the mountain and I meet, you know, two people like first responder types They bring me down and then I go to an urgent care because I can't get my boot off. They have to put me under. They saw my boot off. And then they, uh, once they figure out like my leg situation, because they can actually see it, uh, they ambulance me right to a hospital. I'm in the hospital overnight. I have to do occupational therapy. I see a surgeon. I see like 10 nurses or what felt like 10 nurses. I'm sure it was less. Uh, After this, I go back to SF. And then when I'm in SF, I have to figure out how to get an x-ray. I went to an urgent care. I realized that wasn't covered by insurance. And I was just like, I'm already here. I don't even care because I was in so much pain that I just haven't taken the x-ray. I take my phone and I take a picture of the x-ray, which I guess isn't even allowed because you have to get it reviewed by a radiologist. I was just like learning this whole process as I went. And then I had to go to like all these different specialists, PT, et cetera. Moral of the story, I ended up gathering all this baggage along the way and all these files and all these things that say, this is Adam, this is where he's at. I'm in the worst pain of my life. And I'm just constantly like, hey, this is me. And everybody's just asking me the same questions over and over again. And I was just like, why do these systems not talk to each other super well? So I really, really wanted to find a way to make it so that the healthcare systems could talk to each other a lot better and I wouldn't have to carry files around, like they would just naturally transfer. And this became like obviously very common pain point. Um, But once I dug into it and talked to a lot of those friends from undergrad, which we talked about a little earlier in my wannabe doctor days and my fiance is a nurse practitioner. So I had like very good insight into what their software actually looks like. I realized that there's just files all over the place and they're in zero standard format. And it is a perfect opportunity for generative AI to basically reduce the burden on doctors. Um, When I really dug into the issues and talked to a lot of my buddies who are residents now, you're seeing up to like 60 people a day. It's like, okay, I had these 300 pages and I was giving these people my 300 pages for the first time. Of course, they didn't know me. They had to do it 60 more times. So you kind of got to think about like, how can we make it so that they can ramp up more quickly? And then that led me to create a tool that basically does two things with my co-founders. One, it scours through the like US healthcare system using an interoperability vendor to gather hundreds of files on a given patient. And two, we use an agent that basically parses through those hundreds of files, figures out what is important based off of the type of doctor that you are, and then surfaces it to you. The way I think about the future of all this is the doctors are just going to have to see more and more people. Hate to say it, it's not great, but I think the incentives like in our healthcare system are such that we're going to have to keep churning. And I think it's kind of like a churn and burn, like Zoc docification type of thing of healthcare, right? Like you just want to see more and more folks, the insurance has that incentive. So it's like, how do we really combat that? Well, the two things doctors are doing are like two of the main ways they're spending their day are being with patients or being on the computer. They did not sign up to do all of this other stuff on the computer. Okay, well, why do they have to use the computer? There's the inputs and the outputs. 
most companies in the healthcare space since the advent of all these LOMs are focusing on the inputs, which is an extremely valuable problem. We're not necessarily focused on that. I just want to like call out where a lot of the energy is going. So it's like, take your phone, uh, record the visit, and then that turns into a TXT. Let's throw it to an LLM, and then we'll convert it into the perfect soap note for format, like very summarized, very clean. Upload that into the doctor's file system. Next time they see the patient, they got a perfect note. Super great, super effective. Other thing, intake. You know those forms that you spend all the time just like waiting in that room? It's like miserable. A lot of that's getting automated with LLMs. So it's like, we got all the inputs, but the output. Okay, now we have this huge disparate like file, unstructured sources of data. How do we make the output something that actually is commensurate with 2023? A question that I would have for you when I'm thinking about like how people should be working in the future, like do you use TikTok at all? Just posing that over I, to you. I do, I do. So like, what do you like about TikTok over YouTube? Over YouTube? Yeah. Well, I find that I end up spending a lot more time on TikTok than I thought I would because of the algorithm, the recommendations that seem to know me more than I know myself sometimes. Exactly. It knows you. So you're not wasting time sifting through stuff you don't care about. Everybody's going to be more and more in line with this line of thinking. Why do we use chat GPT as hopefully forward thinking AI people instead of Google? In a lot of use cases, obviously Google's still up and freaking great. Um, it's because I'm not clicking my 10th article, reading the whole way down to figure out that's not actually valid. I just go, hey, ChatGPT, can you give me some data for this claim? And hopefully it'll give me like a pretty solid answer, right? And I don't have to spend the time sifting. So for us, we turn all of the patient files into a one pager that is what the doctor tells us what they want in a template. And ultimately where we would love this to go is a doctor almost has a feed. You could think about it kind of like TikTok, right? Where they're just scrolling the feed throughout the day and they're like, oh, okay, most recent labs, I'm a urologist, did they have a kidney stone? No, we're good. And then go through the other pertinent information that they've designated as pertinent to them. So like in this social media example I'm using, it's kind of like that first time you use TikTok uh, and it says, what do you like? Like for us, we have set your template. You tell us what you like and then based off of that, we populate it with all of your patient's data. So you just look at this one pager um, instead of having to sift through everything yourself. Wow, there's a lot to, to cover. Well, one, I guess the, the first thing is, how's your leg? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I wish it was, you know, the, here's, here's a big problem that it doesn't really have a lot to do with AI. When you really mess yourself up, nobody has the conversation with you where they're like, hey, you're just gonna be like that now. So like, I can't do the same movements I used to do. I always feel a little bit off and I'm just used to it now. But like, I'm still able to play basketball a lot. One of the things that I had to give up was I, I kind of grew up as a skateboarder and that was a really high risk activity. And I feel like I would just blow up my hardware if I got back into that. So that was probably my main loss. I just don't really skate anymore. So overall, it, it could be a lot worse. Because you're, you have a, a Paul George moment. You're, you're coming back from the oh, yeah. injury. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping, I feel like Paul did pretty well post-injury. So yeah, I'm hoping to have a similar arc. Well, that's that's good. Good to hear. But it sounds like it's a new normal for, for you. <laughs> exactly. So. Like, I I feel like I can still move around. I'm just doing it in a slightly new way. Well, I'm super curious about many things, actually, about this, uh, about Hona, about your startup. <laughs> but one thing in particular is, like you mentioned that you have some co-founders. And a lot. Of, I think a lot of people, especially in this, startup journey if, if they decide to embark on it is do you do it yourself or do you partner with people how do you find these co-founders can you share about who these co-founders are how did you meet and what sort of like synergies or relationships did you have that worked yeah i am just like a really really fortunate guy that i have an extremely great group of co-founders like objectively obviously you've been uber and microsoft you just come across so many great people you almost get like desensitized to the fact that you're around all these crazy like Ivy League PhDs all the time. Very privileged, very grateful to have had that experience at um, Meta. But I, I truly think my co-founders are like some of, if not the strongest people I've ever worked with. So I'm very like blessed in that regard. I met one of our uh, my co-founders way back in the day. Her name is Danny Yosef. She went to uh, middle school with me and Danny was a year older than me, but she 
she just had like every box checked really well, like had the really overachieving type of grades. We were, we were in Chicago. She was the one who made it out to California for college because she was like doing so well, super socially healthy. Like she was super cool at our high school and just like someone that I definitely looked up to. And she uh, moved to the Bay and had an exit basically on her first go doing a new way to bring drugs to market faster. So she was finding ways to synthesize proteins without having to do it live in a cell. And her lab actually got acquired. I was back in Chicago for like one quarter just to do grad school. I just ran into her. It was a USA soccer game. And we just got to talk. I was like, you're in San Francisco right now. I haven't seen you in forever. And she uh, obviously knew she would knock it out of the park on the first venture. But when she was like, yeah, I want to go at it again. I was like, please. I would love to work with you. Like if there's anyone from my hometown, it's going to be Danny. Um, So I just really lucked out there. And then because we have this weird, I think we're in a weird part of the Venn diagram where, you know, we're deep in startups and AI have done these sort of things, but we have this root and passion for healthcare from our studies and our peer network. Really so many people like that. So we actually got involved in like the YC communities and wanted to see if there were more similar uh, builders to uh, builders that would want to work in the space that we were because we were just like, healthcare AI or biotech AI, which we're going to take on. We found Shuing, who is just an incredible person. She worked with a lot of folks that made BERT, which is like the precursor to ChatGPT in a lot of ways. She did documents AI at Google, and then she was a full stack engineer at Amazon. But the kicker is that she's also a biomedical engineer. And when we just, uh, when we met her, we were like, this has to be too good to be true. Like you just match every single one of our boxes, super technical and could work with me in that capacity but also just like has this innate passion for the healthcare system. And somehow she wanted to take a swing at things too. So we just started building together and decided to all quit our jobs together. And I've been just making this thing ever since. And obviously startups, it's a grind. And I'm sure you know from all of your work building, you, you spend some late nights with people and you get you get really close over time. So I just feel uh, really fortunate. It's a really, it's a really cool group to work with. Sounds very serendipitous how all this came together. And, it definitely uh, was. And it was fast too. I like I finished B school in March and I was like, I gotta get out there. Uh, and then this all came together. So Yeah. And I guess also timing too for a lot of you all. That yeah. It just seems to be good time, good backgrounds, and just an opportune time, especially with AI and a lot of the enabling technology that yes. has uh, allowed you to to do this. If we could actually talk about that some more, can we go into a little bit more detail on like, why is it now the, the good time to build something like Hona? And what, what sort of innovations, what sort of tech came out that really allowed that to happen? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the difference between Hona and what you see a lot in the healthcare space, which is like more co-pilot uh, note-taking type of tools or like uh, email generating type of tools is uh, we actually need a context window of like a million. Because think about a hundred uh, clinical notes over time and we have to make sense of that. It makes the technical problem quite a bit harder, especially in a field like uh, healthcare where you can't hallucinate. So one thing that helped us out was higher context window models, obviously. But that doesn't really get you all the way there. I'm sure you've played with these quite a bit, given your position. But a lot of these higher context windows models, I feel they're more on the creative side, such that they could read a story and make a story. Uh, For us, we have this like extractive use case where it's go through everything, figure out what's important. And if you use a higher uh, higher context window model, we found through our testing, at least, that they are going to be more prone to hallucination as things get wider and wider. So the innovation we needed was... Uh, one, they still help. So we need like some higher context uh, times cheaper pricing uh, to be able to actually package this type of stuff with okay margin. And then two, we needed to be able to work with agents. And I would say like all of our proprietary tech is in how we've implemented um, our agent. The Langchain library has obviously been like a godsend for us and something that we've derived a lot of our tech from. So I would say like kind of like the combo of a lane chain just really, really progressing, especially with the developer community there, uh, as well as the stuff we've been able to come up with on our own, as well as like wider context windows. But I will say we primarily use GPT 3.5 right now because we have to save on pricing. Like with, when you're processing this much data for it's just not realistic. But it's exciting because the stuff just, we just got an, uh, an email update one day where they were like, hey, your whole business is 25% cheaper from opening AI. And it's like, Okay, this is a really fun wave to ride. I oh, don't know, things are just going super quick and it's it's a fun time to be in the space, so we went for it. The advent of these 
large language models with, you know, you mentioned things like context uh, windows or token windows. For, for the listeners who don't know, right, these models are constrained in some ways, right? They can't do everything that you want it to do. And that's largely because they can only process so many tokens or you think of it like characters or parts of words. And the, the trend, though, is that these models are getting bigger. Those context windows are expanding to the point where some of the latest ones can ingest like an entire novel, right? An entire you know, hundreds of pages worth of, of text. Some of the, that might be overkill for certain applications, but it sounds like for Hona, at least, and what you all are trying to accomplish, that's like a key thing. It's helpful. One thing One thing I'll tell you, uh, Alex, at least as of right now, the state of the art is not there yet for us because the cost of false positives is just so high. We found it to be most effective to have a combination of what I would call maybe a medium length context window uh, combined with like recursive summarization and kind of logicking through all the different chunks of the patient history. Yeah, let's actually talk about that some more. So in the field of healthcare and just call these like regulated industries, right? There's a higher bar of meeting expectations and probably even just covering your bases, right? Legally and all that, that you have to, that you have to meet. And a big challenge in large language model AI development is having to deal with, yeah, as you call it hallucinations. Uh, can you share about like what type of hallucination or what what are hallucinations and then what type of hallucinations do you encounter, in, especially in a healthcare type application? Yeah, yeah. So hallucination, simply put, is the AI saying something incorrectly confidently. And that can't really happen in healthcare. We need everything to be exactly accurate. The most common hallucination that we saw when we experimented with maybe less than ideal models for like our use case was dates. So we try to give a chronology of everything that happened in the patient's life because we think that's probably an easier way to read it than sorting through clinical notes. So example for my ski incident, it's like hit tree, went to ER, went to overnight stay, like just one by one by one by one. On the side of this, to be able to make sense of it, we try to have the date that something occurred if we can find it, as well as the date of the note that recorded it. And that helps us get like more logic through time. When we use the bigger models, it'll just say that the date was like last week. So right there and then you're going to be completely misleading a doctor and it's just a non-starter. So I would say our main like proprietary tech and the things that we're spending so much time just fine tuning, testing, et cetera, is just finding ways to logic through time such that if the model doesn't know something, it doesn't try to just spit the current date at you or spit some answer at you. It just earnestly says, hey, I have no idea. And then we use that, hey, I have no idea, and then process it with all of the other I have no ideas. And then there's the one that has an idea. And then we kind of like get our answer from there by piecing things together. And then that way, we kind of have less hallucination than if we just made one huge prompt to a model and just said like, hey, figure it out. The moral of the story is we just try to like chunk things up so that it thinks through all of the text instead of throwing all the text at the model at the same time to make things a little bit more like simple. I think that whole uh, experience that you're describing, I mean, it's very much akin or similar to the sort of scenarios that I'm working on or working with semantic kernel and the stuff that I'm building at Microsoft. I think that it's a lot of these challenges, right? A big part of it is you're bringing a very like, let's, let's call it like a tank, a tank that is like GPT, well, in your case, 3.5 Turbo, but GPT-4, all these like large language models, super capable, can do all this reasoning, have effectively compressed the world's knowledge into its weights, right? But now you're trying to do a very like specific fine-grained task of like, hey, for this date, just literally grab me, like a database lookup, just grab me the appropriate thing for that piece of uh, specific information. So I think what you all are probably encountering, but what a lot of people building in this space are realizing is that, oh, maybe, right, mixing some traditional technologies, like old school, like databases, plus large language models, plus the reasoning capabilities that are coming from that. Maybe that's like a better way to build these type of applications, especially if you need to get your answer correct, if, especially if it needs to fetch specific information from specific metadata or a field. 
I think it's just fascinating and you know it's very interesting to to hear you all trying to to wrestle and and figure all that out. Yeah, what's uh what's interesting for us is that a lot of the data isn't as fetchable because it's all it, it is so non-standard. I mean, you're talking like like our database could be a list of handwritten notes that have numbers on them. And we got to figure that out. <laughs> so we kind of got to do this harder approach and it's a little more brute forcey than I would like, um, but I, I, I totally feel you. One thing we're looking to do because uh, people's labs are, they're discrete, they're like very quantitative. And I feel like we've done a pretty good job as a healthcare system at getting those standardized. That may be something that we go like, hey, give us a natural language query and then we'll convert that into just like a poll. But at least right now, it's kind of just like processed as raw text on the HONA side, but we're gonna keep optimizing it, of course. So Adam, we talked about some of the work that you're doing with Hona, and you mentioned actually the use of agents in particular. And I'm actually really curious because agents have been a relatively new phenomenon, or at least been more buzzworthy, trendy, especially in the AI circles recently. Um, could you share your thoughts just overall about what are the role of agents and are they a temporary fad or is it something that's here to stay for AI? So I definitely think it's something that's here to stay, but kind of like what I was getting at with the chatbots, I, I don't think that there's certain aspects of the human experience that they're going to do a very good job of replacing. So oftentimes an agent that's standalone where maybe I'm trying to talk to the agent and they're fully replacing a human. Um, an example could be if I was talking to an agent that like was my doctor, right? That might be something where it's only solving half of the people problem. The one half is the information which the agent is solving. The other half is me wanting to emotionally connect. So I don't know if I feel like agents right now are fully addressing like every pain point, but I definitely believe they're effective. Where I think things are extremely interesting is when an agent basically augments a professional such that they're able to do the things that they are uniquely good at. So a perfect example would be maybe a nurse. I think a nurse can really stick out by being a presence in someone's life that makes them feel really good and is great at human connection. I've never remembered a nurse because they were super great at retrieving labs, right? So I think if you can make AI and agents that can logic through different types of work, if it's legal documents, if it's in our case, the EHR, if it's figuring out what sort of copyright is appropriate, figuring out like what the most important things to service are for writing an article. And the human gets to more so spend time doing what's truly creative or what is truly emotional connection or really just what's human. I think it's a win. I actually think it's a giant value add. I think the definition of aging can be a little a little loose. Maybe it's just like, you know, uh, AI that ends up making logical steps that thinks like a human. Um, obviously, that's going to be extremely impactful. Um, and if you can find ways to basically just take out the tasks that we don't like, everybody wins. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely all for augmenting or being a co-pilot, right, for, oh, for your existing work. One thing that I have also heard even outside this whole like agent talk is when you ask someone to do something, right? If you have coworkers and you're like, hey, can you just like do this one extra thing? Or you have a manager who assigns you more tasks. The number one thing that people like to say is like, I wish I just had more of myself, right? I wish I could clone myself. I wish I, you know, I could do that if you, you know, <laughs> if there were more of me. And one thing that I think is a potential for agents and especially agents that can have more of a persona or at least even like adopt your interests, but or your skills and your personality, even then you might actually be able to have that sort of scenario where, oh, yeah, I can actually do a lot more things now, because I actually have more of me to, to do that I can scale myself beyond just uh, one person. Yeah, and it, it's still like, even that like emotional argument I was, I was getting at, I mean, it, it really does come down to like, are you working in mediums where people like truly cannot tell the difference? If they truly cannot tell the difference, then you are actually multiplying yourself. And maybe we get to a point where, you know, like with all these stable diffusion models, people are even able to do video chats that way out. Even now it gets, it gets really crazy. I fully anticipate a future or at least an awkward situation where you're in a Zoom meeting and everyone is an AI. 
They're just talking yeah, to each other. Yeah, I don't other. know what I would have done with that in high school, honestly. Well, Adam, we talked about things that are maybe more trendy with things like agents, but there's this whole other side of the the discussion around topics that maybe don't get enough attention about, especially in a emotionally charged or certainly very disruptive area of AI. So what would you say are some topics or things that people are not thinking about enough in this space? Yeah, Alex, I, I don't want to bore you, but there is one thing that I'm pretty excited about. And I think any healthcare tech CEO would feel the same way. And it's actually just regulatory changes and how they're being adopted, which again, probably drive for a podcast. So I'll try to keep it short. But basically, you have all of these paper health records, a lot of them became digitized over the last decade or so. And the next step of it was, hey, the doctors in those institutions don't necessarily own the health data the patient does. And that way, the patient should be able to control how that data is presented to them. What this means for me, like the technical folks here, is that all of the health data across the country is basically being mandated by the government to get forced more and more into the same API. So there's these standard fields about like every given patient, and it has really, really good coverage. And it's just like every single day, this thing just keeps getting more and more adhered to. Uh, Adhered to means, hey, there's another hospital doing it. I mean, basically every hospital is on it. It's just like more smaller long tail clinics. Uh, They get on it. And then it's like, okay, these fields are required. Um, Let's see, like uh, diagnoses, clinical notes, et cetera. Like these are pretty standard now. The next step, which would be huge for our business, is uh, getting more nuanced things like appointments. Like what is every time that they went to see a doctor? Um, But it keeps getting more and more adopted, which is super encouraging that like this government push is being extremely effective with tech in a way that actually benefits people. The implications for that with AI are so gigantic, I can't even like verbalize them. Just think about the fact that you can get any person's data in the same format and present it to them however you want. Uh, There could be flows where you get folks to consent to anonymize their data, and then you can research all of these different things in a consistent way and start to run predictive models. Obviously, a lot of this is happening right now, but just gets more and more and more possible. So I guess the short answer is the government stepped into healthcare so that we can make much better products. And AI is no exception to that in my world. Do you find that that sort of change is on the order of happening in a few years, months? It's crazy. We got access to external files like the care networks. Uh, we because we're incorporating you know the holistic picture of the patient across everywhere that they've seen. We got access to that based off of a new policy uh, that was implemented last week. So it just keeps going quicker and quicker and quicker. And it's really interesting because I've kind of put myself in these two fields where you have more and more data getting available and the way that you make sense to the data keeps getting better and better. And it's just, it's every day, like every single day. And that also means competition is a real thing too. Like I I think we're a little bit isolated in this space because we bit off kind of a harder, uh, really hard technical problem. And it takes like pretty proper AI engineering to make sense of this much data. Um, But it's just exciting having this many people fired up about healthcare because in my opinion, it's one of the actual problem spaces that really, really matters. Yeah, one thing that I kind of want to, talk about a little bit, maybe what people aren't paying attention to is uh, I kind of look at the world as a lot of people problems. Like if you just get the right people, something great will happen. I'm sure you saw at Uber and Microsoft. It's like your team is just so great that it just happened, right? Uh, We don't have enough of these groups of just unbelievable builders in a lot of industries and a lot of industries that really, really matter to us. Obviously, you're going to have a lot of people at like startups that are trying to be at the forefront of things like at any point. But there's kind of this arbitrage in the talent market right now where you have the layoffs, but you're able to bill any uh, company that you actually can find a use case to with AI as an AI company. So I actually have a very strong, uh, I, I did some feelers to see like, hey, would we be able to pull some really great engineers into a venture like this? And I felt pretty good about it because what we're doing uh, is sufficiently exciting for a top end engineer who just wants to work on the newest stuff. So it's like you're working on the newest stuff, but you're doing it in this traditional industry that you probably never would have considered before. I think there's just so much opportunity, as long as we pay people enough, 
there's so much opportunity for just unbelievable talent to migrate where it wasn't at before. To just follow on that though, because you can argue like the barrier of entry for starting a company, especially an AI company, has lowered, especially with things like the OpenAI API being cheap and easy to use. Do you find it actually maybe also difficult to get talent or that the talent is actually splintered and that's, they're like all over the place. A lot of them are maybe doing their own thing. Maybe if the funding starts to cool down and the, the hype starts to get more settled in that there could be some consolidation. But do you find it actually in this current environment, it's a little challenging also? Because it's very saturated. Yeah, I agree. There's, there's definitely competition, but I would say it's, it's kind of like your peer I'm interview where you're just constantly thinking about the problem. And we picked a problem that is very obvious that kind of decreased a lot of the market risk, uh, but it increased the execution risk because we're messing around with so much more data and the mistakes are so much more costly. That kind of setup, which is all over the place now with all the opportunities in Gen AI, um, low market risk, you're going to completely change everything, high execution risk, can you actually do it accurately, get it done, get it sold, et cetera. Uh, I think those opportunities, no matter what happens within a hype cycle, you're going to be fine. Because uh, no matter what, like, we're just making people's lives better. I think this is the cl- classic, like between the two hype trains, uh, crypto versus AI. I, I just like never really understood crypto. I got, I got killed on Solana and I just like got out of there. <laughs> um, but with AI, like the use case was just obvious. Like it was so obvious. And I saved so much time every day using it. It's just like, how do we put it into more places and how do we get even more value out of these models? So at the end of the day, there is a giant people problem. Like we're not just making solutions for the sake of solutions. And I feel confident that that will persist no matter what the hype cycle is. Well, one thing that is true for a lot of people is they are trying to figure out a way to break in, trying to get involved in this space. They see it happening. They see the writing on the wall, especially if they're in a traditional industry. And they're like, is my job going to be here tomorrow? I don't know. Um, or you have students, right? Students who are just entering university and they're like, what should I study? Is what I'm studying going to be even relevant you know, by the time I graduate? In terms of like advice, because you've you know, had different journeys, right? You, you even studied uh, AI, even though you said that, what, you're more business minded. And could you share to the audience, like what sort of advice would you give for someone who is interested or maybe feels a little anxious about like what they should do and how can they get involved? How can they break in? What, what would you say to them? So the easy answer is just say, do your undergraduate in CS. Um, <laughs> I wish I did that. That would save me a lot of time. Uh, I, I genuinely, I know school, especially in the contrarian, like engineering community can get a pretty bad rap. I did a lot of school. I'm like very happy with the decision. Personally, for me, I'm not like individually motivated enough to just crush some boot camp or crush some uh, like online course. I really needed that structure of having to get the A or whatever to um, like actually execute on my projects. <laughs> uh, so I think the best thing you can do is put yourself in a situation where you actually have to do whatever the project is. For me, you know, I was just going through all of the AI classes at Georgia Tech and I was just forced to. Uh, to get my degree. Uh, And then that made it so that I kind of understood uh, how to build or like what the process looks like, like just what tuning things looks like, testing things. And then the other way that you could do it and what I had to do for Gen AI specifically, because that was a little bit after my studies, I just decided to make an MVP because I was like, I kind of want to make a company. And if you're on the hook for what this MVP looks like, you're probably going to take it pretty seriously. So the short answer is just build the thing. The shorter answer is maybe st- study CS. And then I, I really think those are the main things. And that's probably really scary because like I did so much school that I know the hard majors and the not. And CS is by far the hardest. It's not even close. I don't even know what else you could argue uh, after taking like all this stuff, maybe like chemical engineering. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, I, I think you really just need a motivation to actually build the stuff. But luckily... Uh, getting over the initial hump is probably way easier than when we figured this stuff out, right? Like all that time that we spent sifting through Stack Overflow, all that time that we spent going like, I don't even know where to start with this function, just figuring out how to use Git. You kind of just can ask chat GPT how to get you over the hump in natural language. Like, hey, I got a sort of linked list. Like, can you just make this? 
And then I feel like if you just did that and sort of piece together all your functions into one big system, that could be an interesting way to learn without you having to go through like that very low level, like machine code, like intro to CS type of class. So yeah, just actually build stuff, give it a real shot and it's easier than it ever was. One thought experiment that I have is like, especially for the people who are in high school, you know, high school CS or college you know, intro to CS today, if they can just go to chat GPT or some equivalent and get the answer to their questions, exam questions and whatnot. Will... Alex, can I ask you a quick question on that? Sure, go ahead. Did, did your school make you take those tests pen and paper? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Because you're like, can we look it up? I, I just, that reminded me. I, I always thought that was the craziest thing in the world. My master's, yes. uh, they didn't care about it, but like undergrad, we were just writing it. And I was get penalized for forgetting like a semicolon. And I was like, <laughs> how this is possible? Like they just don't want us to win. <laughs> that, that's right. No, that's right. But I guess that's the other way to prevent the, the cheating. Force everyone to write your Java program with all the curly braces and everything, um, <laughs> semicolons and whatnot and and write it with pen and paper but yeah i mean to me it's like the thought experiment is like oh if it's you know if you're in a education setting or really you're right you're just on the hook to learn something you're you're, you're you go to school you go to college take these classes to actually build that foundation well if that foundation is now shifted towards the ai and you're just like oh i just need to learn how to prompt ai to to do what I want. Is that a better, will, will that help people, the future builders of the world, actually build more things, build the, the innovations that we need to solve the biggest problems that, that we have? What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think human progress is just more and more abstraction so that we can work faster and faster and faster. And this is just like a version of that. And all it does is make that intro to CS class less and less relevant because it's not really what you're going to do all day. It's like when you're doing trigonometry and you're like, when am I actually going to use this? People will start thinking about that, about writing a function themselves. Well, as we wind down on this pod, uh, one more like fun type of question I like to ask people is in terms of like stuff or either media, books, you know, movies, shows, um, just things that have personally impacted you, influenced you, in influenced the way you think, how you approach life. Uh, would you recommend any sort of content that has been really impactful for you? You know, I would say on the content front, one guy that's been sp inspiring me like crazy is a uh, founder named uh, on YouTube. His name is Jay Hoovy. He made Stan. Have you ever heard of him? I have yeah. not. It's, it's okay. It's like a creator specific thing. And that was my world for a little bit at Facebook. And I, I like making YouTube videos as well. So I just kind of followed this guy and he he like willed his company into I think they're doing four or five million dollars in ARR, but he just films himself doing every single thing. So he makes a YouTube video during the week. He's like, this is me talking to my VC about our returns this year. And he's on he's at like the table and he's saying, I'm burnt out and I don't know if I'm the right guy for this right now. And he just films himself doing it. And he's very approachable and like creative. And he's just kind of the way that I want to build my company. I feel like there's this tool set of the modern CEO. And I know this changes because I'm in healthcare, but I feel like we should, at least with an AI, we have to be technical to the point where we know what the trade-offs are. Like we don't have to be uh, the one building it all the time, but we need to be able to say like, what's actually realistic for the business, what's going to cost way too much money. Two, obviously we have to be like pretty salesy and hopefully be able to get the word out. But within that, I actually think this way to leverage um, whatever, being a creator is something that becomes more and more core to somebody who's going to be like fronting a business. I just think like, and obviously you're doing it right now, like you, you're doing an entrepreneurial pursuit online. Like it's, it's very media oriented, even though you're a technical person, it's just this extension of you. So I just think like what Jay hoovey has been doing is really cool to just watch a guy basically gain all these followers because he's literally creating a company and just filming how. And his company is actually like a LinkedIn bio thing uh, so that creators can kind of organize all of their uh, different like SaaS products into one area. So it's just like one link and he saves them a bunch of money. So it kind of like his uh, content matches his ethos and you just get to watch all of it. And as a founder, it's like super inspiring. I'll definitely have to check it out. It sounds yeah, it sounds interesting. Out. I like cool. I like these sort of like day in the life sort of things. And that type of vibe. It's that type of vibe for sure. Well, Adam, 
Thank you so much for this time. One thing to share with the audience is if they want to find you, if they want to find more about what you're doing, learn about your, your startup, uh, where, where can they find that? So you can follow Adam Steinle on LinkedIn. You can follow Danny Yosef on LinkedIn. You can follow Shane Zhang on LinkedIn. And you can follow me or subscribe to me on YouTube if you want. I'm going to be a little bit less frequent about the YouTube stuff because actually, you know, editing takes forever. So again, thank you for this. Um, but I will be posting about uh, the progress that I can reveal on LinkedIn, hopefully like once a week or so. I, I want to have some sort of like paper trail so that later in life, I can always kind of reflect at, at this point because I truly feel like I'm doing what I uh, always want to do. So I want to have a good like uh, memory and just trail of it. So it'll all be on LinkedIn. Love that. Well, maybe you and I, we can do a, a future edition to see what the latest is on, on Hona and see what the progress has been. Love it. But, also, I got to get to know a little bit more about the products that you're working on. I'd love to flip the table around a little bit. Yeah, of course. Happy to. Happy to. Well, Adam, thank you again for this time. I uh, appreciate you coming on the Humans of AI podcast. And yeah, certainly wish you the best. Have a great rest of the weekend. Let's go. Congrats on going for it with this podcast. I went through a lot of your stuff. It's like super high quality, super interesting, great niche. Uh, really appreciate you having me on. See you, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening to Humans of AI. If you're building something with AI or are perspectives you want to share, drop me a note at alex at humansofai.xyz. And be sure to subscribe to my newsletter, Chaos Theory. Until next time, this is Alex, Resident Chaos Coordinator. <laughs>